want to welcome you back to our study that we've been doing, this series where we're looking through the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we've entitled it, Let Us Rise Up and Build. And uh, this particular session is looking at the third chapter of Nehemiah and uh, some lessons we can learn from a work order. Um, if you have a Bible, either hard copy or uh, electronic, it might be good as we go through this for you to be glancing at, at verses we'll refer to. We won't read through the whole chapter, but we're going to make a lot of references to different verses within the chapter that might make more sense if you can glance at your text and um, follow along in that way. I don't know how many of you uh, maybe made a resolution to read through the Bible um, at the beginning of the year, and uh, perhaps if you did, you've had more time to do that in the last month and a half or so. Uh, but that's often a, a common uh, New Year's resolution and a great good one. And, um, you know, people struggle with that at times. They, they, they struggle sticking with it throughout the year. A lot of people get bogged down in a book like Leviticus or in uh, one of those long lists of different names and difficult names that you find in various places in the Old Testament. Um, when you think about it, it's pretty rare to hear a sermon or uh, a lesson based on a text full of names because a lot of times we, teachers and preachers just struggle with what to do with such a passage. Uh, so that, I guess, makes this particular study today uh, a bit rare and different, and I hope it'll be beneficial to you. But we're going to be again in Nehemiah chapter 3, and as I um, alluded to a moment ago, you know, this, this chapter is uh, sort of a work order, and it's full of names, and many of them very difficult to pronounce. But they're there for a reason, and it's a really important reason as far as the message of the book is concerned. Nehemiah 3 tells us how the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was done, and who did it. Again, our title of the series is Let Us Rise Up and Build, and what they're building are the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, they had been destroyed, of course, many, many years before when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonian armies. And then the people, many of them, carried away into captivity. Now, there have been several waves of people coming back to Jerusalem, and it, it sits in ruins, and it's really not even a city anymore, because in the ancient world, if you don't have defensive walls, you're not really a city. Uh, and so they're rebuilding the walls in, in Nehemiah chapter 3. And again, it, it's sort of, as you read it, it sort of sounds like a, a work order uh, of that project written after the work was done, uh, after the fact, of course. And, uh, but it's fascinating to me the lessons there are to be learned from this work order. And I hope it will be to you as well. Um, Nehemiah, of course, is the project director, and when he sets out to, to lead this work, to rebuild the walls, he doesn't um, hire a local firm. You know, he didn't contract the work out to people who did this kind of thing all the time. Uh, likely there wasn't any group like that around at the time, but that's whatever the case, that's not what he did. As uh, chapter 4, verse 6 will say, after the project is done, uh, Nehemiah says, so we built the wall. We. That is Nehemiah and all the people. So it's a real team project, and it was the work of the community. The regular, everyday citizens of Jerusalem built the walls. And that's why you have all these names in this chapter. More than 70 names in 32 verses. And so one thing we, we are aware of because of this is that the people matter in God's work. Individuals matter. 
people with names matter. You matter. Uh, your name matters. Uh, right here in, in the local work, we're talking about the work in Lancaster, Ohio, or wherever you may be, your name matters. As we rise up and build, um, you matter and we build. It's interesting that all this incredible activity and accomplishment of Chapter 3 is, is really a response to a clarion call that was made back in Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, where Nehemiah said, quoting him, You see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with her gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And the people really respond to that call to work in chapter 3. And you see, here's the key. The, the let us rise up and build of chapter 2, verse 18, that, that all the people spoke. Uh, if you remember, they made a commitment. to. They said, uh, let us rise up and build. Look at what that turns into in chapter 3, verse 1. It says there, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers the priest, and they built the sheep gate. You see it? Let us rise up and build, turned into, and they rose up and built. Verbal commitment becomes real action. Faith became works. So that's the way it always should be among the people of God. And, and that's the way it should be among us. The walls of Jerusalem that needed repaired were about two miles long in total. And the work was divided up into 41 sections at least hundreds of people worked on it. Uh, it was organized. It was efficient. Uh, the task was accomplished in a mere 52 days, less than two months, to do two miles of wall in the ancient world. We don't even get that done in the modern world that quickly, do we? So. What I want us to do uh, is glance down through this chapter and notice a few more details of the work and uh, draw some lessons from that work for us today. If you do a little search, maybe in your study Bible, um, look for a diagram of the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. A lot of good study Bibles will have a picture, a diagram. You can do a Google search and easily find a diagram. In my, my copy of the Bible that I'm using right now, here is the one uh, in the English Standard Version Study Bible. Probably hard to see the details of that, uh, but get the idea. Um, you'll notice in a good diagram of this that there are a number of gates mentioned um, that were in the wall that they were building. And uh, these are all pointed out, detailed in, in chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Uh, but the way it's reported in chapter 3 is, is very systematic, and I think, again, very meaningful. I want you to notice where they start uh, in the first verse of chapter 3. They start at this place called the Sheep Gate. Um, and, uh, and then if you jump to the last verse of the chapter, that's verse 32, note again where this report, this work report ends, again at the Sheep Gate. So it's mentioned at the beginning and at the end. And it, it tells us that this work report is sort of a circuit around the walls from gate to gate. And 
if you look at it even more closely, uh, you'll notice that the work order, that is the chapter, uh, Nehemiah 3, moves around the walls in, in a counterclockwise manner. Now, this particular gate, the Sheep Gate, was way up at the northern end of the city, probably uh, the gate closest to the temple itself. Uh, many think that this is the reason it was called the Sheep Gate was this is where the, the sacrificial lambs were brought into the city uh, to be offered in the temple. Now, uh, some suggest that starting the report here at the Sheep Gate is starting at the right place because it sort of symbolically puts God first in the work. In other words, you begin the work of fixing the wall closest to God's house first. You don't start at the soccer field or the concert hall or at the university. You start where God lives. Um, you start where the Creator is worshipped, and you fix things there first. Not a bad priority, right? Um, would that our priorities in society were as good today. Um, our cities, for instance, would be a lot stronger if godly concerns were our priority. So take special note of the opening words of chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's just hear those words together. It, it begins again, referring to this, this high priest. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. That sort of gives you a flavor of what the chapter sounds like as it moves on. So, again, they start at the right place. They fix near the place where God's house, the temple, was. And again, take note of who's doing the work here. Who's, who's fixing the wall closest to God's house? The high priest. Eliashib. It's interesting. The priests had to get their hands dirty too in this work. They didn't just stay in their cloisters and pray while everybody else labored. They moved dirt and stone too. And and we can imagine they got their fingers smashed and had to visit the chiropractor the next day. Just like everybody else, they were involved in the work. But I want you to notice as well that this is not just physical work that we're talking about. Um, what, what do they do when they build the sheep gate? It says they consecrate it consecrate it, not concrete it. They consecrate it. What's that mean? To consecrate is to make holy. That is to, to pray over it, to dedicate it to God. So this physical work that they're doing is also holy work. It's spiritual work that's being done here. God is involved in it. That's really important, isn't it? Something we need to keep in mind. Uh, even when we're, we're doing what we might normally call physical work in the church, in God's kingdom, it's also spiritual work. And I want, to, I want you to take another uh, special note uh, of one other thing before we move on down the wall uh, in Nehemiah 3. And that is the rhythm of spiritual work. Uh, don't miss this, the rhythm of spiritual work. What does spiritual work sound like? Um, it's not just hammers and saws and 
grunts and grunts. Here's what it sounds like. Then the high priest and his brothers with him rose up and built. And then verse 2. And next to him the men of Jericho built. And next to them the next guy built. It's the rhythm of God's work. Next to him, and next to them, and next to her, people, names, together, working for God's cause. It's the rhythm of spiritual work. Beautiful sounds. There really is so much to learn from this chapter that I bet if you were reading through, uh, sort of maybe trying to read through the Bible or the Old Testament, this might be a chapter that normally you'd have trouble keeping your focus. Uh, with all these names and these places and details perhaps that we're normally unfamiliar with. But take a moment here and, and see the riches for us. Just a, a few other things. Please don't miss that everybody worked. Everybody. Well, there's one sad exception, and, and we'll address that in a moment. But everybody worked. The priests, yeah, we already saw that. Um, did big shots work? Yes. Did little shots work? Yes. Glancing down through again, in verse 9, and then in verse 12, we have mentioned two major rulers in Jerusalem who each worked on their own section of the wall. These were guys who uh, were in charge of large sections of the city. They were working uh, just like those who had no governmental responsibilities. Uh, they worked on their own section of the wall. Yes, rulers, leaders got down in the dirt, and they sweated along with everybody else. And, and then there are all kinds of names here that we don't hear any place else in Scripture. And why would we? They're just common folk. Uh, not that they weren't vitally important, but in daily life, no one knew them. But they had a part in, in the wall and in the building of the wall. So big shots and little shots. And then, if you glance again at the last verse of the chapter, verse 32, we've now come all the way back around and, and find out, remember who was working on that first section that's mentioned near the temple, the high priest? Well, we, we do a circuit all the way around the walls, and we find out who was working beside the high priest, and the other priests. Who is it? Goldsmiths. Merchants. I wonder how often these two groups of people mixed in normal daily life in the city. Priests and merchants. Probably not much. I, I doubt that their kids went to the same schools. And they probably didn't get invited to the same parties. But in this monumental work of God, they worked side by side, didn't they? That's what Scripture tells us here in this great chapter, Nehemiah 3. And then look at verse 8. In verse 8, we've got a perfumer, a perfumer, stacking stones in this new wall. I wonder how often this perfumer had had dirt under his fingernails before. Oh, you see, they all worked. They all worked. didn't matter what they did in a normal 40-hour work week. They all worked on this project. For the work of God, they all came together. Priests, 
and perfumers, goldsmiths, and merchants, and rulers. You'll notice if you read through this, you'll often see the phrase, son of so-and-so, for example, in verse 3, or brothers of so-and-so. That's in uh, verse 18. And then, don't miss verse 12. It says in verse 12, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Oh yes, even young girls. This was a work that families did together. God's work always is family work. Another bit of wisdom was that the people often worked on the part of the wall closest to where they lived in the city. So uh, if you've studied ancient cities, a lot of times houses were right near the wall or even in the wall sometimes. And the way Nehemiah organizes the work is people often worked near the section where they lived. So in verse 10, uh, this guy named Jediah repaired the wall opposite his house. Uh, verse 23, three different people are named doing the work right beside their own house. Um, same in verses 28 and 29. Can you see the wisdom in this? Don't you imagine uh, that you would try and do the best possible job that you could to repair the defensive wall of Jerusalem if it was the piece that was right outside your own back door? Well, I bet you would. And so there's great wisdom in the plan, in this work order. But, but it's also true that this, this work order reveals that some of the people who worked on the wall didn't even live in the city. They weren't citizens of Jerusalem. Some were Israelites that lived down in Jericho, um, or they lived in a town like Tekoa or Mizpah, other cities of Israel. And uh, eight different places are named that are, are within sort of a 15 to 20 mile radius of Jerusalem that sent workers to help with the wall of Jerusalem. So this wasn't just a Jerusalem thing. This was an Israel thing. And so all Israel worked on it. And when we think about translating that to us today, part of doing God's work is more than being concerned only with our own little corner of it, whether it be in Lancaster or wherever you may be. It's more than just our own corner of the world. The kingdom is bigger than that corner. And there, there were some of the workers who did a lot, and some a little less. There's a guy named Hanan. He's mentioned in verse 13. And when you do the math, it's revealed that he repaired over 1,500 feet of the wall himself. That's 500 yards. Now think about that. Others had, had smaller parts. Like in verse 21, it says that the people there just had a house length of the wall that they worked on. But all of it was important, and all of it was holy. It was all spiritual work, and everybody worked, um, except for those who did not. There are always going to be some who are too good to pitch in. Uh, such work, getting their hands dirty, is beneath them. And so they would rather just sit back and watch, and maybe even criticize those who are sweating and, 
and maybe nitpick their work. So we find this in Nehemiah chapter 3 as well. Verse 5, notice it says, And next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. The, T the Tekoites, people from this little town of Tekoa in Israel, that we mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, later on, one of the, uh, the prophets, or actually earlier, um, this time, one of the prophets was from Tekoa, one of the prophets that has a, a biblical book named after him. I'll leave that to you to search out who that was. But there was people from Tekoa, uh, not even from Jerusalem, you see, and but there, there are workers that come from there, and they do their part to help. In fact, the Tekoites do more than their part. Uh, they truly went the second mile, as Jesus would later teach his disciples to do. Because way down there in verse 27 of the chapter, they're mentioned a second time. They're working on another section of the wall, another area of the city. Two times the Tekoites are mentioned. But there were these nobles... Um, the, the upper crust, the elites from Tekoa who refused to work. Um, they refused to be a part. They, um, they wouldn't get their hands dirty. Why? Well, we don't know. I just know, and I'm sure you've seen, it's always true, even in God's work, among God's family, that some will refuse to rise up and build. They would, they would rather just sit back and let you do it. And maybe even tell you how you should do it. Never met anybody like that. You see, nobles often claim to know how it should be done. They're just not going to pick up a shovel or, or use their muscles and expend the sweat of their brow to do it. My favorite response to people like that, and, and you can feel free to use this and blame me for the quote if you want, if you ever need it. When one of these nobles uh, sticks their noble noses into your work as you build and repair, and they criticize your kingdom work, say to them, well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. You see, people like that have a spiritual problem, really. Um, it, it's not that they're refusing to work with you. It's that they're refusing to serve their Lord. And that's specifically said in verse 5. They refuse to serve their Lord. But that's an exception in this great story of Nehemiah. Um, most worked and worked hard. Uh, many went the second mile, and many still do. And, you know, if you're a second miler today, God bless you. And you are preparing yourself to hear um, the Lord one day say to you, Well done good and faithful servant. Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I want to close this session with some words from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And just let you think about the link of what we've studied here in Nehemiah 3. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit 
we were all baptized into one body, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, what would, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But God has so composed the body, giving honor to the part that lacked it, greater honor, that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Some great lessons from a work order. Hope you'll tune in next time to uh, this study of Let Us Rise Up and Build. God bless you today.